Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Garden Guru um, workshop this morning. I see there are a few unfamiliar names here this morning. Um, so just for uh, practicality's sake, please make sure that your microphones are muted throughout the workshop. Um, and uh, I see... The, we don't have that many people on the workshop this morning, so I might even um, allow for questions at the end of the workshop. So welcome again. My name is Sue. I'm your garden guru from Garden Shop. And as most of you know, we conduct these workshops free of charge every Friday. And um, it's always so great to see all of you here, um, all the familiar faces. And it's also fantastic to get your emails and to um, reply to all of that and see what what your problems are in your garden and I've actually had a request after last week's talk that we had on soil and soil health that we um, do a little bit more on fertilizer uh, everybody can just please make sure that their microphones are muted please thank you so much okay so um i've had a request from one of our um, attendants that we talk a little bit about fertilizers and the nutrients in your soil today um, which i then duly put together and um Today we are then talking about nourishing your garden um, and it's all on how to make sure that your garden has all the nutrients that it needs. Um, now, if you remember correctly, we did quite an extensive talk on soil and soil health last week. And most of you know that um, I am always um, advocating the, the health of your soil because that is basically the building block, the foundation for a, a, a good and a healthy garden. I'm going to share our PowerPoint presentation with you now, um, if I can find it, that is the share, and you should all have that in front of your screen now. Um, and let me just minimize this bit here put that out in the corner there and let's go over to our slideshow the computer seems to be a bit slow even though it's become warmer over the last few days of which i'm glad but i believe we still have a little bit of a cold spell coming our way and i'm sure we might even have one or two in august and early september as well but so be it and um, you know our gardens also need the cold because the cold gets rid of all of those pests and diseases that that um, gets onto our gardens early in the spring season so yes the cold is is really necessary and it's also necessary for the plants to actually rest like humans plants also need to rest a bit so we're talking about nourishing your garden and how to make sure that your garden has all the nutrients it needs now we know that plants make their own food because they photosynthesize but in order for the plants to actually make their own food they need the right ingredients and that ingredients they actually get from the soil um, mostly through their roots and that ingredients are then used to make other food um, of which plants actually make a lot of and we actually sort of benefit from it as well <coughs> now like babies if they don't get enough food and enough of the right food they will never grow bigger or they'll be ill and um sorry i just want to admit these people here that's it and get that little screen out of the way so we say babies need food in order to grow into healthy adults um and like babies plants also need the right food to grow bigger and stronger and we, the gardeners, must make sure that the plants get that food um, in the right quantities and the right types of food 
in order to make our plants healthy. Now, unlike humans that can walk around and go and find food, plants can't move around. Um, they stuck where they planted. So if the availability of nutrients where they are, are not enough, they can't like walk around and go and get nutrients at another place. That is why we've got to make sure that the environment in which the plants grow, that the nutrients are there available for the plants. And it's our job as gardeners to give the soil the right food in order to keep our plants healthy. I love that little picture of the walking tree though. Um, now there's a few basic foods for plants and we basically break them up in macronutrients and micronutrients and I'm going to go into that more specifically but there are three nutrients that plants need a lot of and that's called macronutrients, big nutrients. Um, and they need those three nutrients in order to stay healthy. And then we also get micronutrients. That's nutrients that plants need um, in order to absorb the big um, nutrients, in order to process the big nutrients, etc., etc. Those are called micronutrients because the plants don't really need a lot of it. They just need a little bit of it. But if it's not available, then the plants will not be able to process the macronutrients. Now, um, plant food are generally called fertilizer. Um, and you get both organic fertilizer and you get inorganic fertilizer um, now, organic fertilizer, it's like eating a fresh uh, vegetables or a, a, a proper balanced meal, while inorganic or chemical fertilizer, it's like vitamin pills or space food in tubes. Um, it's got everything that the plant needs in it. Um, but say, for instance, if you eat space food, you might actually still feel hungry even though your body has all the, 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 the nutrients that it needs. Now, let's get back to macro and micronutrients. What are macronutrients for plants? Um, macronutrients, as we've said, those are nutrients that plants need a lot of. So if those things aren't available to the plant, you will definitely not have healthy plants. Now, I like to break it up in the following way. Um, I like to say that plants need, um, they need protein, they need pulp carbohydrates, and they need vegetables for a balanced meal, just like humans. Now, for plants, the protein, which is not protein, but the, 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 the meat is called nitrogen. Um, and that is indicated with an N, like we can see there. Then the pup for plants or the carbohydrates for plants are called phosphates. And phosphates is indicated with a P. And then the last macro element is called potassium. Um, and potassium is indicated with a K. And Plants need this NPK, nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium, in order to have a balanced meal. Now, what does nitrogen do? Um, I say plant meat is called nitrogen, and it's indicated, as we've said, with an N on fertilizer products. Now, plants really need a lot of nitrogen because nitrogen gives the plant its green color that allows it to photosynthesize in order to make um, more complex food. Now, nitrogen is a very mobile element. In other words, it leaches out of the soil very quickly. It's got to deplete, be depleted quite often. Um, but nitrogen is responsible for the growth of the leaves and the, the, the branches of the plant. And it then, as I've said, makes the plants green, which um, helps the plant to then photosynthesize. 
Um, so nitrogen is a very, very important um, nutrient for plants. And you'll quickly see if you've got too little nitrogen, your leaves would become sort of yellowish and uh, your growth would be stunned. Now the next element for plants, basically the pulp for plants, or uh, the carbohydrates for plants, it's called phosphates or phosphorates, and it's indicated with a P on all your fertilizer products, and that is both your chemical and your organic products. Now phosphates helps the root of the plant, like pulp makes people strong, um, phosphates also makes the plant strong. Um, so it encourages strong roots. That's why it's quite important when you are planting um, new plants that you give them enough phosphorus or phosphates in order for them to get their roots established in the soil so that they can absorb the other nutrients. Now the last one of the macronutrients is called potassium. And potassium is basically like vitamins for people. Um, it keeps plants healthy um, and it also helps plants to um, grow proper food, fruits and flowers. So if you want lots of fruits and flowers, then potassium is the nutrient that you need to feed your plants. Now, it also helps with the general health and the hardiness of the plant, especially in winter when it's colder and the plant is under more stress because of the cold weather. Um, and it usually promotes growth and larger food. So those are the three macro elements, the nitrogen, phosphates, and potassium. So let's get to the micronutrients. And why do plants need micronutrients? Like humans, plants sometimes need sweets as well. You know, if you've got a little kit and you're just gonna give them um, pup meat and um, vegetables, the kit is not going to be too terribly happy. Every time you go to the shop, you're gonna say, mommy, 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 or auntie, or grandma, I want some sweets, I want some sweets. So um, plants basically need these micro elements to keep them happy. Um, and it also helps with absorption of the macronutrients. And like with children, you can't give them too much sweets because then they're going to get rotten teeth. Plants also must not have too much of these micro elements because that could also jeopardize the health of the plant. Now, the gardener must make sure that the plants don't get too many of these sweets or micro elements because that is, as I say, not healthy for the plants. Um, but sometimes we might see that there's a shortage of some of these elements, these micronutrients for plants, and we might have to add some into the soil. And I'm going to come back to the micronutrients when we talk about organic and chemical fertilizers a bit later on. So, Microelements for plants are things like boron, zinc, um, magnesium, molybdenum, chlorine, um, iron, copper, and uh, many, many other sort of elements that the plants need in order to stay healthy. Now, um, I've always been fascinated by, by this um, sort of little periodic table song, which was um, done, I think, in the early 20s um, by some teacher who wanted to teach the children about the, 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 the um, periodic table and all the elements on the periodic table. So I thought it's fun. Let me share that with you as well, which I'm going to do now. So it's all about the, um, uh, the, the periodic table and then all the elements in the periodic table and see if you can spot the ones that is necessary for plants. First has ammonia, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and iron, americium, ruthenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, rutesium, vanadium, and lanthanum, and osmium, and acetine, and radium, and gold, protactinium, and indium, and gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. 
There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, and boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, chromium, lithium, beryllium, and barium. There's holmium, and helium, and hafnium, and erbium, and phosphorus, and francium, and fluorine, and terbium, and manganese, and mercurium, and lithium, and magnesium, and strontium, and scandium, and cerium, and cesium, and lead, praseodymium, and platinum, and plutonium, palladium, promethium, potassium, polonium, and tantalum, magnesium, titanium, tellurium. And cadmium and calcium and chromium and curium. There's sulfur, californium and fermium, berkelium, and also mendelevium, einsteinium, nobelium, and argon, kryptonium, and radon, and and rhodium, and chlorine, carbon, cobalt, copper, tungsten, tin, and sodium. These are the only ones at which the news has come to Harvard. And there may be many others, but they haven't been discovered. And Well, that's just a little bit of fun. I hope you enjoyed that. I always enjoy that little song. And yes, subsequently, since that song has been made, um, there has been the discovery of quite a few other elements that has now been added to our periodic table. So um, let's get back to those elements. And let's talk about the NPK ratio. Now, the NPK ratio, um, is the ratio of nitrogen, phosphates, and potassium in your fertilizers, whether it's organic or chemical fertilizers. Now, those three numbers are very important, and you will always see it on any fertilizer bag, whether it's organic um, or chemical, or even uh, on um, soluble fertilizers. So what does it mean? Um, say, for instance, oh, let's start from the beginning. The first number on your fertilizer bag indicates how much nitrogen is in your fertilizer. The second number on your fertilizer indicates how much phosphates or phosphorus is in your fertilizer. And the last number would indicate the amount of potassium. So if you've got an 18, 24, 6, that would mean it's got 18 parts of nitrogen, 24 parts of um, phosphates, and six parts potassium. Um, so it tells you what proportion each micronutrient, um, what proportion the fertilizer contains of each one of those micro, macronutrients. Um, and the first number, as I say, the N, that's always your nitrogen. The second number, the P, that is your phosphates. And then the last number is your potassium. Now, how does that help us? And we're going to get to that because there's other things too that you see on a fertilizer bag. And you will see on that picture that I've got here on the right hand side, there is a 26 that is in a bracket next to the 315 there. Now, what does that mean? What that says to me is that only 26% of what is in that bag is actually nitrogen, potassium, and phosphate. Okay, so the rest of what's in there is what we call a carrier. In other words, it's a vehicle to deliver these um, nutrients to the plants. So you can see that um, if I do my maths quickly, that would give us like 74% of this fertilizer is basically carrier, whereas only 26% of it is um, active ingredients in, in the fertilizer. Now, why do we have a carrier element? because we need a way to deliver this fertilizer to the plant. And also where we get to things like nitrogen, for instance, we cannot deliver um, the nitrogen into a concentrated form to the plant because that will then um, burn the plant. Now, the interesting thing is for most chemical fertilizer, your carrier is basically lime and for organic fertilizers, your carrier is carbon. Now, why is that important? First of all, lime is basically a salt. 
um, lime has got quite a high pH. Um, so a prolonged use of chemical fertilizers in your soil can lead to a build up of salt in your soil or in your pots. Whereas organic fertilizer contains carbon as a carrier and carbon is a very amazing element in the way that it actually strives to neutralize things. So if you um, alternate between say a, a chemical fertilizer and an organic fertilizer, the carbon in the organic fertilizer will then neutralize the effect of the salt. In other words, it would bring your pH down to uh, a, a, a more balanced pH. Um, and you won't get that salt built up in your soil. The other thing that lime also does, lime being a salt is not very beneficial to um, the organisms in the soil like we discussed last week. And um, the carbon on the other hand is very, very um, conducive to soil life and all the microbes that you get in soil. Now there's a last bit that you usually get on some fertilizers and you will see the letters SR at the back and all that tells me is that this is a slow release fertilizer. In other words, um, it's a bit like a, uh, a capsule that you get from the chemist. Um, the, the shell on the capsule is going to slowly dissolve in your stomach and then releasing whatever medication it is that you're taking slowly into your system. Now, a slow release fertilizer basically works on the same process. In other words, it's going to release um, the, the nutrients into the soil, not all at once, but in a more spaced out period of time. Um, so now that you know what you're buying, um, you can also look at the micronutrient content. Now, some fertilizers, especially your soluble and liquid fertilizers, they contain a lot of micronutrients. Um, and then your organic fertilizers um, naturally contains a lot of micronutrients as well. Um, and those things are usually listed on the product label. Um, you'll see you might get iron, zinc, magnesium. Those are good for establishing roots of plants. Um, whereas when the plant starts growing, um, the plant needs iron and zinc and magnesium and um, copper and boron. And then when the plant starts flowering, it's going to need more iron and more boron. And then when it's in its mature phase or a fruiting phase, it's going to need copper, molybdenum, and boron. But as I said before, plants need these micronutrients in very um, small quantities. Um, and uh, your organic fertilizers usually has enough of those micro elements in them naturally um, for the plant to survive. Whereas your chemical fertilizers are usually um, quite clean. They don't have any of those micronutrients instead, uh, unless it's sort of indicated on the bag or on the bottle. You also get solutions of micronutrients um, that you can give to plants. But as I say, if your soil is healthy and you maintain a healthy soil, then you shouldn't have a problem with micronutrients in your garden. So how do I choose the correct fertilizer? Um, in the beginning of the season, when you want things to grow fast, you're obviously going to need more nitrogen um, because you also want the plants to go green, um, like for instance with your lawn, and you would go for something with a very high nitrogen content, um, something like a 713 for instance, is great to use um, early in the season to boost growth and to make your plants 
nice and green. Um, just remember, if you use any chemical fertilizers with a high nitrogen content, always make sure that you water it very well because nitrogen can quite easily burn the leaves. Now, uh, for later in the season, and if you want to sort of grow vegetables, you want maybe stronger roots, etc., etc., good fruit. Um, you could use something like a 315, and the 5 being the potassium will then sort of help the growth of fruits and flowers on the plant because you must remember that the fruit and the flower are basically the same part of the plant, it's just a different stage of it. Um, and then if you want to um, fertilize your flowering shrubs, and roses and things like that. You could use something with a high nitrogen content in the beginning of the season because you've pruned your roses and you want them to now quickly grow out. So you're going to need a high nitrogen and then your shrubs and things usually have quite established roots. So you're not going to be too bothered about the phosphates. And you must also remember phosphates is not a very mobile um, element. So that actually stays in the soil quite long, but you want to promote your flower growth. And um, so you would want quite a high um, potassium content in your fertilizer. Then you can look at things like an 815 or even a 315, which would be great. Um, then for general fertilizers, you can look at things like a well-balanced fertilizer, like 321. I also like to use 315 when I'm planting, because then I know that the plant is getting what it's going to need when it starts growing. Now, there's always an argument going on about organic fertilizer and chemical fertilizer, um, but both of them are significant and I think for me it's, it's like a balance between the two. Now first of all you must remember chemical fertilizer is basically immediately available to the plant like the space food or like drinking a red bull but chemical fertilizer does not sustain soil health and it doesn't have any micro element deposits unless it's indicated on the bag or the bottle that you're using. So they provide, both provide the nutrients to the plant, um, but they provide it in a different way. Um, organic fertilizer would be a more sustainable fertilizer, where chemical fertilizers would be an instant boost. And that's why I say um, for me, it's important that one actually sort of finds a balance between these two things. As I said, organic fertilizers in general, the nutrients are not water soluble and they release to the plant slowly over a longer period. Um, and I like to apply uh, organic fertilizers in autumn because the nutrients will then be available in spring. Um, they will stimulate beneficial soil organisms and they will also improve the, the structure of the soil. Um, and soil microbes play an important role in converting organic fertilizers into soluble nutrients that can be then absorbed by the plant. In most cases, organic fertilizers and compost will provide all the secondary or micronutrients that your plant need. On the other hand, chemical fertilizers or synthetic fertilizers are water soluble. They can be taken up by the plant almost immediately. Um, and you can even, you've got to be very careful when you apply it, especially with a high nitrogen content because you can actually damage your plants by burning them. Synthetic fertilizers gives plants a quick boost but do very little to improve your soil texture texture, it doesn't stimulate soil life or produce or improve your soil's long-term fertility. Um, because as I've said, it contains salt, which can actually make your soil brack over a long period of time. 
Because synthetic fertilizers are highly water soluble, they can also leach out into streams and into ponds. Um, synthetic fertilizers do have some advantages. In early spring, I like to give my lawn a good 713 um, because that's going to quickly stimulate the lawn and I'm quickly going to have very green lawn. But then I prefer to then follow that up with an organic fertilizer. Um, There's one other way that plants absorb nutrients as well, and that's through, through their leaves, through their foliage, and they can actually absorb quite a lot of nutrients through their leaves, um, actually 20 times more than through their, their roots, but it's like um, giving plants a drip, as it were, um, somebody that's dehydrated and gets a drip, um, you can't keep the person on the drip uh, all along because then the person's whole system is not going to develop and if that's not a, the drip is not available then that person might get very ill or even die. Now the same uh, goes for plants. You shouldn't be using too much foliar feed for your plants. Yes, it will grow your plants very quickly and you'll have lovely flowers but you're going to do very little to actually improve your root system of the plant which in the end um, helps to make your plant more sustainable and stronger for periods of time when um, the foliar feed is not available. Um, so as a result, spraying foliage with liquid nutrients can produce remarkable yields. Um, and for the best results, it is then um, uh, advisable that you do it when the plant is in its active growing stages such as plants planting time, blooming time or just after the fruit sort of becomes set on the plant um, and then as I say in early spring when your plants really need to start growing out. Now as I've said, um, I don't know where I've got some bit missing here. Oh, no, I don't. Okay, so how do we know what's wrong with our plants? Um, now, there's very many ways that um, we can see what ingredients or what nutrients it is that the plants are lacking. Um, you'll see if you've got a nitrogen deficiency, your leaves of your plant would become yellow. Um, but with an iron deficiency, your leaves of your plant would also become yellow. Now the interesting thing about the, the relationship between nitrogen and iron is the following. Like our blood um, basically consists out of red blood cells which is basically iron um, and then sort of uh, uh, circulates around our lungs that binds with the oxygen in our lungs and that iron particles are actually transporting the oxygen to the rest of our body. Now the same uh, goes for plants. Iron also helps um, plants to actually absorb nitrogen and to synthesize nitrogen. Now there's other things that you can see on plants. If you've got potassium deficiency, for instance, you might have a green inner leaf, some sort of yellowing on the side of that and sort of um, brown dead tips at the end of the leaves and that could be an indication of a potassium deficiency. A phosphorus deficiency, you will see that the veins on the leaf would be green and intermittently um, you would have yellow in between of that. So there are very many ways that you can see um, what sort of uh, nutrient deficiency it is that your plants have got. but um, as I say, uh, usually if you have good soil health and you maintain good soil health, you shouldn't have any of these problems. Now, as I said, I think the most important thing is that if you're talking about organic and chemical fertilizer, is that you keep a balance between the two. Um, and 
I think if you ask plants, do they prefer um, chemical or um, uh, organic fertilizer, the answer would be they couldn't really care next because to them, nutrients are nutrients. But there are significant differences between organic and chemical fertilizers in terms of the nutrient availability and the long-term effects on the soil where the soil then actually makes its own nutrients where you would have to supply less additional nutrients to your soil in order to keep it healthy. We must also remember that unlike nature, our gardens um, usually have um, sort of plants planted closer together. So the strain on the soil in terms of nutrient availability is more and that is why we might have to add some nutrients at time from time to time. So let's talk about compost. Um, and if we talk about compost, you basically have two types of compost. Um, the one is cold compost and the other one is hot compost. Now, the one that we usually use as gardeners is basically the cold compost process. But what is hot composting? Um, it's for the more serious lot. Um, uh, it's a much faster process and you can get compost in one to three months during warm weather. Um, but you need four ingredients in order to cook that compost faster. So in, in a hot composting sort of situation, those things are going to be added into the um, compost heap at different times and different um, stages in order to make the process faster. And that is nitrogen, carbon, air, and water. And together those items then feed the microorganisms, which speeds up the process of decay. Now, cold composting is as simple as collecting yard waste or taking out organic materials in your trash and such as fruits, vegetables, peels, coffee grounds, etc., etc., and then putting them in a pile or a bin, and over the course of a year or so, the material then decomposes. Now, what we use in our gardens are um, mostly sort of a combination between the cot cold and the hot composting um, process. We usually try to make the, the, the material that we put into our compost heap a little bit finer and then we um, sometimes add compost activator which is something that then um, puts those microbes into the soil in order for the composting process to speed up. Now um, we also get vermicompost and that's where you basically use earthworms to digest all the um, organic material that you feed them and that can then be applied as compost. It's usually quite concentrated. As I said um, last week, um, one earthworm sort of releases 10 times its body weight in nitrogen every single day. So um, the vermicompost, people often sort of soak it in water as well to release those nutrients and then they apply it as a liquid fertilizer to their plants. Now, what can you use for compost? And I think it's quite important that you, do, you, you sort of um, look at what it is that you can use because um, I sometimes find that people come to me and they say, oh no, they don't want to get a compost heap because um, they've got lots of flies and whatever, whatever, whatever. Now, if you use the right stuff in your compost heap, you won't have flies because you must remember that flies and maggots are basically um, things that thrive on oil and protein. So um, in an, a, a, a vegetable type compost heap, you will not get those things. So what can you put in your compost heap? You can put fruit scraps into your compost heap, apple cores, whatever you want to, um, vegetable scraps, all those peels and things like that. Um, note, not 
cooked stuff though. Um, you can put coffee grounds into your compost heap. Um, that would also help with your pH in your compost. Egg shells can be put into your compost heap, but not eggs itself because eggs has got too much protein in it. Um, you can use grass and plant clippings. Where it comes to grass, be very careful um, because we're going to talk about the, the brown green matter in your compost as well. Too much grass um, in your compost heap is not very beneficial for it. Um, you can use dry leaves in your compost heap, finely chopped wood and bark chips. Just make sure that it's not treated wood. In other words, wood with um, uh, uh, creosote or varnish or paint or things like that on it. Um, you can use shredded newspaper in your compost heap, but do not use glossy magazine paper in your compost heap. You can use straw in your compost heap and you can use sawdust from untreated wood. Now, what must you not put into your compost heap? Um, not only will these items not work as well in your garden, but they can make your compost smell. They can attract animals um, like rats and um, flies and maggots. Um, so these items should be avoided when you are making your compost heap. And the first thing is anything containing meat, oil, fat, or grease. No go for your compost heap because it's not beneficial. The fattiness is not beneficial at all for your microorganisms that needs to decompose the compost. Don't put diseased materials, diseased plant materials in your compost because when you then spread the compost in your garden, you will spread these diseases amongst your plants as well. Sawdust or chips from treated wood, don't put that into your compost heap because that contains chemicals. Um, don't use cat or dog feces in your compost heap. Again, you will attract the wrong sort of organisms to your compost heaps. Um, do not put weeds that you've taken out in your garden that has already seeded into your compost heap. If it hasn't seeded yet, then that's perfectly fine. And then also don't use dairy products in your compost heap because again, that contains protein and it contains fats as well. Now I find an easy way to make a compost heap is just to do it from some pallets and I use five pallets for it. Um, I, and some cable ties, so I lift one pallet off the ground on the bottom, placing it horizontally, and then I just stack up another four against the sides, tying it with some cable ties, and voila, you've got an excellent compost bin, and it's also then very easy to um, turn your compost um, in that that, that sort of bin and I'll, I'll explain to you um, as we go along how to do it. Now, um, the other thing that you need to do once you start putting in your material for your compost is to actually layer it. Um, and you would usually have um, sort of bigger material at the bottom of your compost heap. Then you would have a dry layer or what we call a brown layer. And then you can have a green layer and then you can put a little bit of soil over that section if you want to. Um, you can give it a bit of water, um, then you start layering it up again, um, a brown layer, green layer, and um, then you can put some manure as well if you like. Just make sure that it's manure from um, herbivores like horses or um, sheep or uh, cattle, so that type of manure you can use in your compost heap. Um, it might just make it smell a bit. Chicken manure can also be used. Um, so you just stack it up until you get to the top. Now the interesting thing about the decomposition process is, and I think we've spoken about this before, is that we get two phases in your decomposition. The first lot of bacteria in decomposition 
is an anaerobic phase. Now those bacteria involved in that decomposition actually uses nitrogen to live. They are not aerobic or oxygen breathing bacteria. So that is why it's very important that you never put undecomposed material into your soil because you will then take out um, nitrogen from the soil instead of putting it back. Now your second phase is your aerobic bacteria and they basically need oxygen um, and that is also the stage where you're going to start turning your compost in order to let the oxygen in for those um, organisms to basically breathe and help with the decomposition. Now, um, as I said, it's important to turn the compost once you get to that second stage, that second phase, because you want to give um, oxygen to the, 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 the bacteria that is busy with the decomposition of that material. And um, that pallet um, crate that I've made then makes it very easy to turn my compost because all I do is I just put a shovel in between those slats and I just like sort of wiggle it all the way down and that way I can actually get air into my compost without having to turn a whole heap over. Um, now when is your compost ready? You'll see usually compost sort of heats up when it's at its maximum sort of decomposition um, period. Um, it can really get very hot. Some people even heat their water through compost heaps. Um, they even in places, some places in the world, use compost heaps to generate electricity through the heat that it gives off. Um, so then you'll see the compost will start cooling down and once it's cooled down to about say between 25 and 30 degrees celsius you'll also see that the material that you're looking at is finer it's usually of a darker color and then we can say that our compost is cooked and it's ready for use and what do you use it for um well you can never have too much compost in your garden. You can dig it into your soil. Um, if you're preparing new beds, um, you can use it as a mulch layer on top of the soil, um, which will really, really improve your soil health. Um, and then you can usually put like say 10 to 15 centimeter layers of compost on your soil. And this time of year is a fantastic time to actually do that because um, you're going to then um, give that nutrients to the plants in the coming growing season. Some people also steep the compost into water, extracting the nutrients over several days, like a type of a tea, and um, then they use that water for um, their pot plants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera because that nutrients will then be absorbed in the water. Now, I think a lot of you know about Bukashi, and that's basically the same thing. Um, the Bukashi water that comes off is basically then decomposed material. Um, but you must remember that what's in that bin um, is not fully decomposed. So um, I usually put that back onto my compost heap, the, 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 the scraps of food, um, and that then decomposes fully. But in the meantime, you can then use that water or that tea from the compost in order to, to feed your plants. Um, the Bukashi also, that, that, that sort of um, bran that they sprinkle over it, it's basically just, um, a, a compost activator. In other words, it contains um, the bacteria to sort of kickstart your compost. Now plants require many nutrients, as we said, um, the primary ones, macronutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and we know now that um, nitrogen is needed for your leaf growth. 
um, phosphorus or phosphates for your root growth and seed formation and um, flower formation is um, due to potassium. Um, and all these uh, ingredients or all these uh, nutrients come to the plant through, through its roots. Um, and when soils do not have sufficient nutrients available, um, deficiencies can be seen in plants. They will have stunted growth. They will have discoloration of leaves. They will have weak flowers or little flowers. Um, and that is why we always need to make sure that our plant have all the things it needs. Because you must also remember when plants are under stress, like humans, um, they will be more prone to diseases. And um, in other words, you will not have healthy plants. So the beauty and the healthiness of plants in your landscape is a direct result of the health of your soil and the availability of the nutrients in your soil. So that's it from me on nourishing your garden. I hope you found that helpful. Um, if you need to uh, have any questions, please uh, do send me an email and I'll gladly try and answer them for you. So um, tomorrow we are doing our fruit tree pruning and care workshop online um, from 10 o'clock until 12 o'clock. If you are interested in joining that workshop, it is 200 Rand and um, you can just send me an email. I'll give you my email address a bit later as well, but I'm sure all of you know that. Send me an email if you're interested and I can send the details through to you. Um, then we've also got our gardener's course, which will be at our Parktown branch. Luckily, now that we are on lockdown level three, we can actually continue with our, our physical courses. So on the 24th of August, um, we're starting our physical gardener's course at our Parktown branch. And on the 25th of August, the physical course at our Bryanston branch. So if you're interested in that, um, send me an email and I can send you the details for those courses. And I'm sure you're all sitting at the edge of your seat because it's competition time and I'm just quickly going to call Normalisa. So if you hang on two seconds for me. Unfortunately, Doris hasn't been able to join us as yet. She is still recovering from COVID, um, but she is doing well. And I'm hoping that she'll be back with us next week. Um, she is much better than what she was. And um, Normalisa is going to stand in for us again today. Thank you very much, Normalisa. Um, we're going to miss you when Doris is back. Maybe you'll have to make turns. <laughs> so last week, um, our question or our competition was sponsored by ProTech. And our question was to name any one of the three main types of soils. And I got all your emails in and it's all in our basket. And the lucky winner is going to win a ProTech hamper. Don't you want to bring us that ProTech hamper? Um, let me quickly get back to our... Uh, there you go. Now you can see us all. And you can see Normalisa as well. I think we've been a little bit closer to me. <laughs> so this is our ProTech hamper for this week. Um, and uh, we are now going to do the draw. So name any one of the three soil types. Indeed, one of the, uh, the three main soil types were clay, loam, and sand. And who's going to be our lucky winner? Have you mixed it up? Yes. Okay. Right. 
and we do have a winner and our winner is um susan hall congratulations susan um you said uh, on your email good morning sue thanks again for a great presentation answer of the week clay soil um name one of the main soil types so congratulations susan i'll be in contact with you um to get your prize to you but do not despair as usual we have another competition coming your way and this week Talborn Organics is sponsoring a hamper for us and funnily enough they've got a new product on the market which is a liquid fertilizer and it's called Nourish so um, they will definitely put some of that Nourish into the hamper that can be won this week um, so it will be a fabulous hamper from Talborn and all you need to do is once again send your answer to me I forgot to um, put it on the next slide. Um, so the question for this week is, what is the benefit of organic fertilizer? The question, again, what is the benefit of organic fertilizer? And like most of you know, you just send your answer to me, Sue B at gardenshop.co.za and your name will go into the draw for next week's um, competition where you can win a Talborn Organics hamper. So that is it from us for today. Um, I hope you all have a lovely weekend. I think I'm seeing some of you tomorrow on the workshop um, on the fruits of the earth. Um, so Yes, I'll see you guys who has registered for that workshop um, tomorrow. And for the rest of you, have a fantastic week. Um, stay safe and keep gardening. And um, in our little cartoon today, we've got um, a guy that says he's collecting manure from the cow for his strawberries. And the <laughs> lady there says, Oh, well, I always put cream and sugar on mine. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be so healthy to put cream and sugar on your um, strawberries um, if they still plant. We are, by the way, going to do a lovely workshop on strawberries as well. I think on the 20th of August, which will be really great because Mayford has got this fancy new product and it's actually called strawberry seeds so we're gonna have a good chat about strawberries on the 20th of august and that's definitely one of my favorite favorite fruits do you like strawberries somalisa <laughs> me too if i can get strawberries i don't need anything else in life <laughs> well as i say that's it for today thank you very much again for joining us sending those answers for the competition so that you can get into the draw to me subi at gardenshop.co.za if you need to phone me at double one four six five six four eight five and remember we've got our garden gurus in all our stores if you've got any questions for them um at broadacres at salongzi parktown it's godfrey and at brianston sibuyile so if you go into the stores just ask for those gentlemen terribly knowledgeable and I'm sure they will help you with any one of your queries or questions. Stay safe, keep gardening, until next week. Thank you very much. Pleasure.